Thanks, brother. Appreciate the warm welcome earlier. Very good. It's certainly a, a wonderful joy to be here, and I thank you for having us. Um, yes, there's a, so much I could say, but I think, um, I think if we might just turn to our first scripture in Exodus chapter 33, please. Let's start there. Exodus in chapter 33. While you're turning there, the work in Vancouver is going wonderfully with the Lord's blessing by his grace. Um, we've seen um, new people at the meetings and had some baptisms recently. Um, it's been a lot of joy and it's been a particular joy. The Vancouver Fellowship has been working with and enjoying the fellowship of the, um, the folks in Seattle and Victoria as well. So that's, um, that's been great there in northern the north part of the Americas, so praise the Lord for that. What I want to talk about this morning, no, we're this afternoon, aren't we? You'll have to excuse me. My Pastor Chris wouldn't let me have a coffee this morning, so my brain's still not working very well. I'm sticking to that. <laughs> right. Um, I want to talk about the glory of God today. I was seeking the Lord about what to speak about, and I, I particularly was mindful of the convention that's coming up something I'm very much looking forward to seeing. Um, Don't Knock Noah, the play and the, the, the blessing that will come from all the evangelical activities of the, of the convention, which will be my first, so I'm very much looking forward to that. But in, in looking at the program and what's coming up and the, just generally the fellowship of the church, all of it is to the glory of God. And that is an incredibly wonderful and also quite powerful thing. Sorry. There we go. Gotcha. So the glory of God. And, of course, the glory that people see in your life and in the church is the glory of God upon us all. And there's a... A great parallel here in the life of Moses and, and this aspect of the Exodus that illustrates how the glory of God comes upon his people. And that's what I want to try and describe and, and go through, I guess, some of the, the parallels. When it comes to the descriptions that we have in the scriptures of the glory of God, it's most often associated with a bright light. That was certainly the case when when the presence of the Lord came upon Paul on, on the road to Damascus, bright light from heaven, he was blinded by it. Um, and, and there's quite a lot of scriptures we won't have time to look at um, regarding the brightness of the glory of God. We'll look at a few. But Moses himself was quite an interesting character. The Bible describes Moses as very meek and very mild-mannered, very humble which is an incredibly important attribute for us all. But Moses went from being so meek and mild and, and humble to, to saying to God, look, I can't, I can't do what you want me to do. I'm not eloquent in speech. I can't, I'm not up to the task. To being incredibly bold before God in, in his requests of God and his statements to God. And we're going to look at the boldness that Moses had. And there are aspects that we'll read here that I think give us a bit of an indication of how the journey Moses went on to, to be bold before his God and to see God's glory directly. And, and I think there's instruction for us all, um, and it's certainly been an encouragement to me. There's a scripture in the book of Hebrews that I'll just quote for now that's been a great blessing to me over the last few weeks. And, and it's in Hebrews 4, it says, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Um, and whilst I want to stick primarily to the glory of God in, in these thoughts today, Moses came boldly before the Lord. And I, um, I guess I want to explain why I feel he got to the point where he could boldly come before the Lord and and speak the way he did, which we'll read of in a minute. And it's an opportunity we all have to be bold before the Lord, whether we are outgoing or whether we are, are not that. Um, so if we just pick this up in Exodus 33 and in verse 12. Exodus 33 and verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, 
Thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. So he starts off, in, in my view, fairly bold. He's talking to God here. He goes on, he said, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. God said that to you as well. We've been given a new name, the Bible says, and, and we've found grace in the Lord's sight. Moses goes on here and he says in the next verse, in verse 13, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Moses had a desire here to know and be shown and understand the Lord's way so he could follow in it. And he knew that if he followed in the Lord's way, he would find grace in the Lord's sight, and so he did. And so there's a parallel here with our testimony, a people who have a simple desire to know the Lord's way and to follow in it, and thereby find grace in his sight. And, and that's how we've come to know the glory of God in our lives, a, a desire in our heart to, to seek out God, to look for him and to be guided by him and to follow him. Verse um, 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now, I just want you to park that promise there of giving thee rest. Where the presence of the Lord is, he will give his people rest, even when you might be very busy, or even when there might be storms or trouble. Whenever the presence of the Lord is with us, which is always, there will be rest. We're going to circle back on that a little later. Verse 15, And he said unto him, so Moses' reply, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. So the discourse here that Moses had with God was quite direct and I think very bold. Um, right. Verse 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? That was a question mark. Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And so now we, we, we've read about following the Lord's way. We read, we read about that rest, all of which I'm sure we can relate to. And so we, we begin to read a picture here of the promise of salvation in, in, in our time in the gospel. And, and it goes on here to speak about what we would know in a New Testament sense of sanctification. Separation from the world, world, the work of the Holy Spirit within us, to keep us separate from sin. So shall we be separated, I and thy people. And so the Lord's taken us out of the world. We're still, as it were, here, but given us a goal, a, a, a job to do, that his grace and glory might shine in our lives so that other people might see it and I'm certain that's not only a testimony now I'm certain it will be the case as as we go through convention particularly um, it's of course not a one-off but if we keep reading for the sake of time verse 17 and the Lord said unto Moses I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. That's an interesting and a very bold question. Moses inquired and he asked God, he said, all right, show me your glory. And, and what I see in the culmination of that question is everything that went before it led up to this Moses being bold to come before the Lord and say, show me your glory. Had those things that we read of previously not sort of been laid out, the, the opportunity Moses to, might have had to, to even ask the question might not have been there, let alone the ability for God to reveal his glory to Moses. Moses and, and the people, in, essentially, they needed to be entered into God's rest. They needed to be separated. They needed to be followed, following in his ways. As the Lord guides and leads us, it's no different. 
And then he shows us, and he shows us, his glory. And this is what Moses asked. Very bold of him for, for someone so meek and mild that when God spoke to him, Moses said, can't do it, not me. We, we go on here, um, verse 19. And he said, so God's reply, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy and he said verse 20 thou canst not see my face for there shall no man see me and live I think that's a reference to the magnitude of God's radiance and and the limitation of mortal men but we go on here God made a way he Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. That always makes me consider whether or not there's a reference there to the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock on whom we stand. Verse 22, And it shall come to pass, while my glory pass by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by, and I will take my hand Take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but thou shalt not, um, my face shall not be seen. So Moses got to see something that arguably I don't think anyone else got to see. A, a physical represent or an, an image of the back parts of God Almighty, reflective of God's glory. Had Moses not asked for that, I don't think it would have happened. So the boldness that Moses had to request this of the Lord and all of the foundation work already sort of being done there, it all worked together for it to happen. And so Moses saw the glory of God. Now, we might not see it in such a physical way, but the promise of the New Testament with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, as I hope to explain in a minute, we are all, every day, we have access to the glory of God in our lives and the glory of God can be seen upon us and the church as evidenced with the presence of the Lord going with us, his light shining upon us, illuminating the way that, that he'd have us to walk. If we could go back, please, um, to chapter 24 of Exodus, there, there are two particular aspects that, that occurred with Moses that I think maybe led him down the path of that boldness towards God to ask to see God's glory. And the first one that I want to highlight anyway is that he spent time with God. We spend time with God in prayer. But we read here of Moses going up into the mount in verse 15. And Moses went up into the mount and the cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord shone upon, upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The seventh day. You know, we read in, in creation, God rested on the seventh day. And um, we read there about rest with, with the Lord and the presence of the Lord giving his people rest. Seven also in Bible numeric speaks of the perfection of God. And, and so here shone the glory of God upon the mount. Moses waited and had to wait six days and then on the seventh day, and I think that's got particular significance, God called him. Verse 17, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount, and Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So this, this happened before Moses asked to see the glory of God. Um, and, and so what an incredible request it was when you think of it that we started with in reading Moses requiring to see more of God's glory after he'd been through this. But Moses 
here he spent time with God. He communed with God. God, obviously, in that 40 days, he spoke to, spoke to him and, and it was delivered to Moses the Ten Commandments. If we go to Exodus 32, Exodus 32, So it was important Moses had the opportunity and took it to spend time with God as he was called to do so. And the Lord calls all of us to spend time with him. Time apart, time in prayer, time in fellowship. And so as Moses continued on being led by God, um, we know there were problems with the, the children of Israel. They, um, they sat down to eat and drink, they rose up to play and as Moses was delayed coming back down off the mount they made themselves a golden calf and and of course this angered God and I don't want to focus on on Israel's sin here but rather Moses's reaction to Israel's sin um, if we read here in verse 9 and the Lord said unto Moses I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff necked people now therefore let me alone that I might that my wrath may wax hot against them that I might consume them and I will make of thee a great nation and Moses besought the Lord his God and said Lord why dost thou thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand now that's a pretty bold question Moses was taking a, a bit of a different position than God had. God made him this offer. An offer that if Moses was motivated by taking glory to himself rather than looking for the glory of God, Moses would have jumped at. If Moses was interested in having glory to himself, this offer would have been irresistible. But that wasn't Moses' goal. Moses wanted to see God's glory upon his people. And of course, that's our desire too. For all mankind, that they may experience the wonder of the glory of God in their life as we have. And, and so, like Moses here, we, we're not a people that are looking for glory to ourselves. We want people to see the glory of the light of the Lord upon us. And by his grace, as we walk humbly with him, we do. And people see it. They see that whilst we might be meek, humble before the Lord, that the glory of the Lord and the light of God shines upon us, that we are a people at rest in the Lord, separated from the world. So Moses here, very bold towards God, says, hang on a minute, why, why would you do that? Verse 12, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. That's a, um, I don't know who else ever called on God to repent. That's, you don't get a lot bolder than that, do you? And, and Moses, really, the way I view it was, jeopardizing his own well-being by doing so that's how I see it anyway so what was Moses's motivation here Moses was motivated for the will or for the best um, for the people of Israel this was a prayer of intercession he was interceding on Israel's behalf at I would argue his own risk Moses was laying down, as it were, his own life, interceding to God directly on his people's behalf that God might spare them. And in doing so, not only was he jeopardising, in my view anyway, he's a, you could view it that way, his own life, but he was doing it at the same time as rejecting God's incredible offer to make of him a great nation instead. He goes on here. He wasn't finished in saying, telling to God, suggesting that God should repent of this evil against thy people. He says in verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest thine own self, 
and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And, and well, I guess we can read the rest there. And all this land that I have spoken of, will I give your seed that they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So what an incredible relationship here Moses was having with God. And, and the degree of Moses' boldness I find inspiring and scary, but, you know, when you think of your relationship with God and the authority that he's given us to approach the throne of grace, to find mercy and grace to help in time of need, we, we have the opportunity to be partakers of the glory of God shining from heaven in our lives. And... and I'm not suggesting any of us should in any way argue with God. I don't think Moses was necessarily arguing, but what I wanted to highlight here was this prayer of intercession that Moses put the well-being of the people of Israel before his own. And, and of course, he was not alone in that. There were others that, that did the same, even in the Old Testament. Um, examples that we could look at, but we don't particularly have have time to do at the moment but but just to highlight there this prayer of intercession to lay down his life and I believe that attitude that Moses had was was all factors and the answer that he had for God here all a factor that led him to being able to see in quite an incredible way the glory of God in his life and right where do we go next? I'm just mindful of not running out of time. We'll go to the book of Joel, chapter 2. This um, desire that we have to see souls saved, to, to see people find the power of God to save their soul and to meet their needs and to work in their own lives. Um, I guess very similarly to what Moses had a desire for for the children of Israel. We're in a different time in the, in the gospel age and the Holy Spirit has come. Jesus had died to send the Holy Spirit. We're going to sort of go get there in a minute. But when the glory of God descends, the brightness of that is, um, is blinding. You know, again, we, I'll just quote it for the sake of time, but in Second Chronicles, when, when they dedicated the temple to the Lord, the, the presence of the Lord fell there was 120 priests that couldn't stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. The glory of the Lord had filled the house, and the 120 priests couldn't stand to minister in it because of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. There are 120 souls, about 120 on the day of Pentecost, when the glory of the Lord filled the house, and um, the Holy Ghost fell like as if tongues of fire, and they all spoke in other tongues. There are parallels here all the way through of the manifestation of the glory of God upon his people. And that's our witness and our testimony, that shining of a people whose lives have been changed by the power of God. And um, what a blessing that is. But of course as well, Within our own hearts, the Lord puts that prayer of intercession to pray for the salvation of other people, to lay down our lives for the brethren, to, to care and to look after. And that's the nature of God's people. It always has been, and it is to this day. We read here, this is a prophecy in the book of Joel, in chapter 2. And um, if we just read from... Verse 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Turn you unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Interesting parallel there. We, won't go too deep into that. Verse um, 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. And then it turns here in verse 15 to the direction given to the church. 
Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. There's that separation from the world, the work of the Holy Ghost. Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So this is the union of Christ and the church at his return. Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. This prayer of intercession, that, that's what's on our hearts. We know the world is in a mess and the, the um, sin that's all around, they're lost in that. Our prayer to the Lord is, that there might be some that get saved from it. And at this time, it would seem, when the Lord returns, the prayer of the church here, between the porch and the altar, that has great significance also. Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. So give not thine heritage to reproach. This is the prayer that the church will have for for national Israel most likely but it's a similar prayer of intercession that Moses had all of which culminated in Moses seeing the glory of the Lord and when the Lord returns the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea if we go to Matthew chapter 17 please Matthew 17 this is where I'm going to try and tie all these points together somewhat Moses got himself in trouble the, the beginning of his calling he, um, he did exceptionally well he, he, he spoke with God he changed as it were God repented him of the evil he saw God's glory in, a, in an incredible way but there was this one time when Moses took glory to himself his view towards the children of Israel may have been tarnished by some of his experiences with them. I guess you could understand that a little. But when it came to smiting the rock, Moses took credit for himself. He called the people rebels and he, he got up there with his chest puffed out a bit and he said, do I have to go and get water for you? And that displeased God. It displeased God to the point that God prevented Moses at that time from entering into the promised land. And there's a warning there for us. We are here, every one of us, to give glory to God and never, ever in any way take it to ourselves. We're here by the grace of God. Without him, without the power of, of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, where would any of us be? So Moses tripped up a bit there. I believe it was probably a one-off and I'm certain he repented of that. But the punishment God had at the time, I always kind of viewed as fairly severe. He was not able to enter into the promised land. He could watch, but he couldn't get in. But we read of a coming together here that saw, as we'll read, Moses inside of the promised land. Miraculously, incredibly, he got there in the end. It took a while. It took till Jesus came. But if we read here in the, the, the account of the transfiguration in verse 17, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother. Now, the way I read that is if it's after six days, it's on the seventh day, signifying the great rest that the presence of the Lord will always give to his people and the perfection of God's work in our life. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. One of the first things you teach your kids, don't look at the sun, it's too bright, it'll burn your eyes. His face did shine like the sun. Here's Jesus the, the personification of the glory of God in the, in the earth. And his raiment was white as the light, 
And often when you read descriptions of Jesus, if you read them in, in the book of Revelation and, and even Daniel with eyes of flame of fire, the glory of God. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Moses got there in the end. The significance that I see, and I'm not saying it's the entire significance necessarily, but Moses represented the law. Elias or Elijah was the prophet that called fire down from heaven. And in Jesus we see the coming together and the fulfilment of the Old Testament law and the power of the Holy Ghost being poured out from heaven through the sacrifice that he made to make it so. And so Jesus essentially is, is the glory of God all wrapped up into one. And he's given us by his grace and all mankind for that matter the opportunity through the outpouring of the Holy Ghost to have the law of God written on the fleshy tables of our heart and, and the Holy Spirit fall from heaven on our soul whereby we speak in other tongues and worship at God and be lifted up in our fa most holy faith. And, and all those aspects that we read of in Moses speak about our calling and our walk in the Lord and how we see more of God's glory operating in our life and amongst us. And that is the primary testimony that makes the Lord pe Lord's people stand out from, um, I guess, broader religion. A people with an experience with God whose glory is upon them. So here we see Jesus, the transfiguration, and there's Moses. And the location was inside the promised land. So he did get there in the end. Verse, um, verse 4, Then answered Peter, <laughs> oh Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be, there, be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hmm. You know, hear him. The, the affection that God had for his son who was God's glory and, and to think the privilege that he's given to you and I that we can be partakers of all of this and in fact the salvation you've been given is the culmination of all of this rolled up what a precious salvation we have that, that, that we are partakers of these events that happened 2000 years ago longer as you go back to the exodus I'll let Pastor Jock tell you about exactly when that was <laughs> he's got the dates all figured out what an incredible thing and, and sometimes I feel anyway for myself you can take it for granted and yet when you, when you start looking into the scriptures at, at the fullness of the salvation that we've received and how it ties in with the whole plan of God dating all the way back to to the book of Genesis for that matter our testimony is amazing we are living representations of the plan of God for the salvation of the souls of men and that prayer of intercession that we have that they might be partakers of it too the Lord answers and people see it if we go to Acts chapter 7 we read here of what I think is the first martyr Stephen Stephen was uncompromising when it came to his testimony. And when he was brought before the Jews and questioned over his testimony, it, my, my Bible says at the top of the, the page, Stephen's apology. <laughs> I don't read of him apologising too much for anything. Good on him. He told them and he, he told them, he spoke of Moses. He, he, it's, it's a fantastic chapter to read. We certainly don't have time to read through it all. But Stephen was bold. A character of God's people is boldness through the power of the Lord within them. So don't let your nature hold you back. If you, by nature, are, are more retiring or timid, 
Well, so was Moses, and it didn't stop him. We read here of Stephen, who was, we're told, full of the Holy Ghost. Um, if we go down to verse 54, and when they heard these things, that was Stephen's apology, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So here Stephen saw the glory of God. What a, what a comforting image, revelation that would have been for him to look up and see this picture of God and Jesus. And he saw it because he was full of the Holy Ghost. We read on here, verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul hadn't yet seen the glory of God. That was to come in the future in the, on his road to Damascus. Verse 59, Saul being the apostle Paul as he became. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and with a loud voice and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. There's that reoccurring thread of our prayer of intercession. No bitterness, no remorse or resentment or, or anything of that nature was was in Stephen's heart towards the very people that were murdering him as they murdered him. His prayer, lay not this sin to their charge. Prayer of intercession, a prayer of salvation. And I know growing up in the Lord, you know, we, we'd often hear about the dangers of the world. But let's never let that affect our mind in, in the way we view people that are trapped in the world. It's our calling, whether they accept it or not, to show them the way of escape and to t tell them about the wonders of the Lord's glory. And if there is anyone new here for today, you can experience the glory of the Lord in your life. The Bible lays out a really simple plan. Repent of your sins, be baptised in full immersion of water. I checked it out, it's just behind there. And the promise of God to you is that he will show you his glory through the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and you'll speak in other tongues. A supernatural experience whereby if you ask, God will show you his glory. That's incredible. I, I don't have words. Incredibles are pretty pathetic, really. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 1, arise. That's good for us all to do. Get up. <laughs> Shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. This is a prophecy of our time now. In, in my Bible, there's some writing just at the top of the, um, the verse here and it says the glory of the church in the abundant access of the Gentiles the glory of the church and the glory of the church is the glory of God upon her shining forth his glory shall be seen upon thee and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So like I said, often when you read of the glory of God, you read of this bright shining light. And that's what the Lord's done in our hearts. Praise the Lord. We'll finish, while I'm still in the yellow, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3.
2 Corinthians in chapter 3, verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Can't go into all of the, the meaning of that, but in the tabernacle and in the temple, there was a veil that separated, that, that blocked people from entering into the holiest of holies where the, the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat. Verse 15, but even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Moses, that's the law. They, they never got to understand, this is speaking of the Jews, the whole reason and purpose for the law, why it was given, what it was for, all of which pointed people towards the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews, sadly, in the hardness of their heart, were clueless to it. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, when the, when the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And that's what the Lord's done for us and give us an understanding, particularly of the tie-ins and, the, and, and the, the types and parallels of the Old Testament and how it applies in our life now. Verse um, 17, now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That glass in the, in the Greek, and I'm really stepping on dangerous terms, I'm not Greek and Pastor Manuel's listening, I think. But I believe, fairly, I, I researched it, that glass is a reference to a mirror. With open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit of the Lord changes us into that same glory, from glory to glory. So that's the thoughts that I had for today, and I'm going to leave it there now and hand it back over to Pastor Chris.